one eye. Now, this was the first thing that I saw today. Uh, it was just a post from Branking Points, which, by the way, it, you know, it's important to highlight that as we do in the interview that the consul at the embassy, it, it's actually considered legitimately Iranian territory, right? So like once you cross into the U.S. consulate or embassy, you're considered to be on U.S. territory, right? So when they write, Israel launches an attack in Iran, I mean, le technically that's true, but I think that's really confusing and manipulative. Man manipulative. And a lot of people then thought this meant they attacked in Iran, right? But the point nonetheless was this is the first place I saw it, which is why I shared it, the link to the Guardian article that highlighted that it happened and, and said Israel did it. But I was saying I was verifying, and I also wanted to make a point how frustrating it is. Oh, was it over here? Oh, maybe I didn't include it. In any case, that Vanessa is wildly shadow banned. And I, 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 I look, the point was that I didn't even see her work. I've got her, be the, the little uh, bell. I mentioned it in the beginning of the interview. The point is that we can't let, just like always, whether it's from my platform or Twitter or anything, we can't let it, you guys got to go directly to the source all the time. And I do myself too, just like I'm seeing that, that miss here. I should have gone right to Vanessa's platform and like, what is she saying and what's going on? But I looked through the feed and I didn't see it. Why? I mean, both Eva and her are, have the little bell. They should be coming up my little list of the people that show up and they weren't there. Why is that? Well, you know why. But I'm still mad at myself for not, and my point was after the fact, that because uh, Orwell showed it to me, I thought, oh, well, she already posted this. And, and she did confirm it already, right? That this person was killed. I'll, I'll explain this all for people who haven't seen what's happened yet, but, and that they bombed the consulate. Now, overall, if you haven't seen the story, the reality is that Israel has bombed the Iranian embassy in Syria. And that is a massive escalation. But really, They've been doing this for a long time, killing Iranians, killing people they claim are associated with Iran, or just bombing anything that they want because of Iran narrative. All of which are dramatic war crimes, all of which are actually acts of war against Iran and Syria. So it's a big escalation, but how they respond will, you know, the point is they're, it's a, it's a strategy. It's tactful from Iran and Russia to not just bumble into the response like the U.S. and Israel have been doing. Before we play the interview with her, I want to show you just quick videos here. You can see of the what it looks like, showing you the complete destruction of the area, destroying the Iranian embassy. Rather, what it appears to be is the building attached to it, but it's the consular building. So it is the embassy. So some of the people that are saying the building next to the embassy, trying to make it kind of differentiate, it's still the embassy. But it's not the main embassy building, but it's the consular part of the embassy. So it's, you know, it's so much gets lost in the partisan nonsense where people want to make it seem like you're lying about that. No, it was just a building. It doesn't even matter. No, this is a very big deal. Salman Ahmed highlights the same thing. Say he's reporting six people were killed. You can see the videos, just all the, you know, destruction. Here's the Guardian who is early citing Israeli airstrike, which is pretty rare, it seems for me, at least from corporate media. They, they, because it's pretty clear that Israel did this, even though Israel's kind of being murky about it. And they're citing that Israel did this and killed people, also arguing our, a commander of the Iranian military. Of course, here's times of Israel going alleged strike because they have to just watering it down, even though it's very clear what happened. And again, building adjacent to Iran. So people that are saying that are the ones that are towing the Israel line. That's, the, that's my point. Because the truth is, it's the consular building, which is the embassy. Now, Vanessa has confirmed that's, that the senior commander of the Quds forces Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahidi has been killed. And that is a huge deal. It's not a, a terrorist. It's a, it's a high-ranking member of the military. I mean, you know, this is like Mark Milley being killed and acting like, oh, just because we don't like the U.S., that's a terrorist and doesn't matter. Well, even if just because you call him a terrorist doesn't mean that it's still not a crime. You know, this, these are extrajudicial assassinations, guys. This is outrageous. Now, one thing I want she, one thing she reported to me just before I play this, after the interview was done, was essentially that apart from the general we just showed you, uh, Mohammad Hadi Haji uh, Rahimi, who is the uh, from the military from Iran, says that five officers accompanying them were also killed, and that, the names I, I won't list off because I'll probably mispronounce them and I don't want to insult anybody. But the point is that there's a lot. That at least the six does seem to be accurate. So let's play this interview with Vanessa, and we'll end with a couple more points. But. Thank, you know, thank God for people like Vanessa and Eva and anybody else that's actually there braving the situations and telling you what they believe is the truth, whether or not it's an uncomfortable reality that's going to be, you know, that's going to get them censored and shadow banned.
So joining me now to discuss the recent attack on the embassy, the consulate in Syria of Iran, the Iranian consulate in Syria is Vanessa Billy to discuss the inner workings around this. We've been trying to vet this story this morning. So I decided to invite her on to give us the inside word on what's going on. As usual, she's light years ahead of the corporate media and pretty much everybody else. So Vanessa, thanks for joining. Always good to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, Ryan. It's good to be back on. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to start with before we get into the mm. Seemingly, you know, it must be Tuesday since Israel's bombing Syria, right? It's just a constant thing that seems to happen. Uh, I just wanted to point something out that uh, you recently posted about, and it, it it came up, it affected this very conversation for me, which is the thing we all know, the shadow banning, the suppression, Twitter, and so on. But I was frustrated this morning because I saw this this story, and it was being sent to me by other people, and and, and what I saw was from accounts that I didn't feel like I, which, you know, we should ever trust in general, just, you know, should verify for ourselves. That I couldn't verify, and so I posted it saying mm. I'm, you know, got some verification. And then I, some of our uh, other people in the community sent me your work, and you'd already verified it, you know, half an hour before that. And I'm just going, I, you know, and I have your bell checked and everything. I just think it's important, even for myself, because mm. we as we were talking beforehand, to realize that we can't get comfortable in things with any social media platform, Twitter especially, because I'm expecting to see Vanessa's work because I have it checked. But of course, I never see any of her content or Eva Bartlett or anybody else important in this conversation. So I just want to highlight that. And I wanted to shout out your work here and how much excellent work you're doing on Twitter and elsewhere. And that you're already, you know, um, yesterday or two days ago, posting, reposting due to shadow banning. It's just sad, you know, how much has <laughs> happened. Just to open that. So any thoughts on that before we get into the bigger topic? And no, I mean, you know, it's just crazy. Or there, there's not very many journalists in Syria right now. Um, and yet, you know, my work is getting damped down uh, tremendously, especially on X, not so much of, obviously on Telegram and Substack yet so far. Mm -hmm. um, but X is, is yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. really frustrating. Because even for me, I don't often see you and I don't right. see Fiorella, for example. I don't see Eva. I have to go and look for their stuff. Um, and, and as you said, you can't rely on the feed. You have to actually kind of have in your head the people that you need to go to for certain specific countries or situations and actually go to their page. And then it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> it's like I missed all that, you know? Right. Very frustrating. <laughs> and, and things yeah. just like this, especially time sensitive conversations like this, yeah. where it's developed, and there's a lot going on, you know? And, and that, so let, let's get right into that. I think this is, you know, this is mm -hmm. actually a really, really important development. And that's just rant, some of the first things that I saw pop up through my feeds. Really, we should be, you know, focusing on some of the work I think you've been putting out and so on. But that, that this is something that we've, as I much briefly said in the beginning, it's this is, you know, as much as the, the embassy is a huge, you know, political step, it's really mm -hmm. the same difference of keep bombing Iranians, bombing Syrians, bombing anybody in between, simply because they say Iran is present, even though that's not a crime. They're allies of Syria. So in this very first story about both the bombing of the embassy and then the discussions around who was killed, multiple commanders, what, where's the veracity on this? Give us the intake on what's going on and, and what's true, what's not. Um, well, basically this afternoon, Israel uh, Israeli jets F-35 fired, um, I think it was six missiles, might have been more. Um, I mean, the, the explosion was so loud. I'm based in Western Damascus and it's around gosh, actually, I don't really know, around 30 kilometers, I guess, from here to, to Meze to the center. But I honestly thought they had targeted one of the buildings near me again, because there had been a, a prior assassination attempt here and an entire building was destroyed. And so then I called my friend and he was like, no, 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 no. it's in uh, central Damascus. I'm on my way there now. Um, so basically the entire building was destroyed. It's not actually the main embassy. It's kind of the consular section of the embassy, which is a fairly kind of ragtaggle building anyway, to be honest. But the whole building was destroyed. Elements inside the Iranian embassy were, were damaged from the blast and surrounding buildings were also damaged. So far, we only have confirmation and i was really waiting for that because a number of channels again had put out the information but i was like okay no official channels are saying it yet but right. sadly it is confirmed that brigadier general muhammad reza zahedi um, was assassinated there is potential that there are two other senior irgc um, advisors in syria 
also killed, but we don't have that confirmation yet from the Iranian ambassador. So it's very possible because I think there were seven um, martyrs altogether. Um, five, as far as I understand, uh, were Syrian Arab army um, guards uh, around the building. Um, and we're waiting for the confirmation of the other two. But, you know, as you said, this isn't only the assassination itself. This is an attack on Iranian territory, effectively. Even the Russian MOD has put out a statement saying that this threatens open regional war because Israel has effectively just attacked um, Iranian territory, right? And not only attacked Iranian territory, but potentially assassinated three senior officials. I mean, Zahedi, as far as I understand, was pretty much the most senior IRGC commander outside of Iran. Um, he was in charge of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. Um, and this followed, um, basically this followed on from an attack this morning, which was very close to me at the um, uh, Research and Development Center in Jamraya, which is in Western Damascus. Um, that was hit by uh, six missiles. Of course, they're trying to target the weapon development process, but that's deep underground. So it caused massive fires above ground and a number of martyrs, obviously. But the smell of burning could be heard, like, could be heard, sorry, could be smelt um, for hours after that attack. Sure. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the the important part here for those you know that aren't aware of the you know diplomatic dynamics of this, it's technically that the embassies are considered actual mm. Iranian territory, right? Like land. Mm. So if you're in there, you're in Iran at that point, like ar arguably yeah. politically. And so that's really important, and that's why it's considered that this is a a major step. Now, this is yeah. I, this I want your opinion on this, and you know how I mean all this is going to be kind of you know theoretical, like what we think they may do. But you know, you're you're a student of this. You study this more than most I know, and I I want you. What do you think? First of all, you know, obviously I think it's clear. You tell me your thoughts that Israel did this to push. That's what you said in the beginning. They want this mm -hmm. to spin out a larger war. The, the the more extreme aspects of the extreme parts of all of their government are clearly saying this openly. I mean, there's they're on mm -hmm. on the record saying we want this to happen. Smotrich and others. So. Do you think this was designed to make this go out? And do you think Iran is going to act in kind? Do you think they're going to strategically respond like we've seen in the past? Is it going to be immediate? Like, how do you see this playing out? I don't think it's going to be immediate. Um, if you remember, I think it was back in January, there was another assassination in Damascus, again in Mezze, when a, a whole apartment building was destroyed. And Iran, at that point, responded pretty rapidly. It targeted um, Idlib and Erbil in Iraq, which um, was or, or is claimed to be a Mossad uh, headquarters. Um, I, I don't know if we're going to be, see something similar this time and as quickly, because of course the danger is, and Israel is doing this on purpose, the attacks are being carried out on Syrian territory, because who do they really want to provoke at this stage? It's Syria. Um, they want to expand the war into Syria. And what is very important, I mean, for example, not only these last two attacks, so the one this afternoon and the one this morning, but a couple of days ago, there was that major attack where um, Israeli uh, jets actually violated Syrian airspace over the US base, illegal military base of Al-Tanif on the border with Jordan. They entered into the Syrian central desert area, and from there they fired missiles into the east and a couple to the west of Aleppo at the same time as the Al-Qaeda elements in the northwest and Idlib carried out an attack on western Aleppo. And actually, it's no different in the last two attacks, because what we've seen with these Israeli um, increase in Israeli attacks on Israel expanding the war into, into deeper into Syria, um, because last week also they carried out um, uh, over 60 missiles uh, attack in the northeast in areas around Deir ez -Zor and on the border with Iraq, killing, of course, not ISIS, but killing uh, Syrian National Defense Forces, IRGC forces that are basically there to fight ISIS and um, to protect the civilian population in the northeast that's under the occupation of the US. So what you're seeing right now 
is an, an escalation in the terrorist attacks, both from ISIS coming from Al Tanif into the areas east of Homs and north of Damascus, and then from the northwest attacking all the axes, so West Aleppo, northern Latakia, southern Idlib, in conjunction with the Israeli aggression. So it becomes very clear that what Israel wants to do is to expand the war. If it can, of course, it will. It, it, the pretext of provoking Iran on Syrian territory, this is all pushing towards open war, but in Syria, not in Iran. I don't think Israel right now is going to take the war to Iran, but it wants to defeat um, Hezbollah, Iranian forces, and of course, uh, Syrian uh, forces inside Syria. Yeah, but so uh, it's interesting because I would, I would, I think that it, it, the, it, the act seems to suggest that they would want Iran to respond. But you're saying you, mm. they don't think they want it to be in Iran, but more so taking place on Syrian territory. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's interesting that I think that the dehumanization of all of this and other angles, mm. you know. It, the, the killing of the of the of the commanders, you know, just the general way that they conduct themselves, Israel in yeah. in Syrian yeah. territory. You know, I, I've I've talked about this as you have for a long time, where it's just like I, that's the joke I kind of made at the beginning. It's Tuesday, they're bombing Syria, and that's a <laughs> yeah. there's no war declaration, there's no legal justification for it in any sense. They just say Iran's there, and then because mm -hmm. there's no pushback of any kind, not even a statement from the UN from anybody, it becomes like this precedent mm -hmm. where well, Iran's there that's a legal target, even though that's not true in any sense. So now when they bomb the, the consulate, it's almost the same argument, right? I mean, why is it any different? All the rest of the legalities are ignored. So it's like, you kind of see like, maybe that's even a ploy to kind of push that boundary, that, which is, I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of people like work on Macy and others say, you know, this is going to change the diplomatic dynamics of the world if they realize, well, there's just no diplomacy now safe if they just go terrorist, you are mm -hmm. bad guys. So we, you know, that's what they're essentially doing. And so I see that dehumanization, the killing of the commanders while well, they were there. They're bad guys because they're present. And I'm already seeing that argument spin around in the corporate response from Fox News angles mm -hmm. and different things saying, well, I stand with Israel because they were terrorists. It's like, I mean, just think about the irresponsible, wildly dangerous step they're making with that statement. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I mean, imagine if Russia carried out an attack on a U.S. embassy in, I don't know, Belize or somewhere like that, right? because they're terrorists, because they just carried, they just engineered an attack right. um, on uh, Russian territory in Moscow. Right? What's like the that. difference? Yeah. But, but, that, but that's what it comes down to. The thing is that Russia wouldn't do that. But for the US and its allies, it's perfectly okay. You know, it's perfectly okay for the US and the UK to be bombing Yemen without a single mandate from anywhere, right. when in fact Yemen is under the under the genocide convention it's doing what it should it's preventing and punishing genocide yeah. you know our and world is completely upside down at the moment it's, it's just insane you know I, I i agree with you but i kind of feel the way that i'm sensing this these days is that you know and i think you probably agree it's always been upside down i think that's the thing we didn't well, really yeah. see for most people. and right now it's this this shocking jarring awareness for average <laughs> people Going like, yeah, what? Yeah. The law doesn't matter? You know, like just crazy things that are like, you know, basic concepts, but things that nobody they didn't want to admit to themselves. And Israel's full genocide right out of the right off the bat, it shook people free, you know. And I mean, I still stand by that. I don't think this was, you know, there's all sorts of multifaceted agendas taking place all around it, but I still argue that whatever happened, even including the possibility that there was factions or entirely parts of their government that allowed it to happen, I think that the way they responded was irrational it was emotional and it allowed everybody to shake free from these kind of classic manipulations even the just israel you know i think that, mm -hmm. i think that's what the u.s government is so worried about right now they've seemingly lost control of all this and one of the most important aspects of this that directly tries back to the united states which i think all of this does when you scratch even past the surface is the isis al-qaeda point you just made I made this point about ISIS bombing Iran, uh, Kerman attack, right? And that interestingly overlaps with the recent attack in the Crocus City Hall, the ISIS-K overlap, and all these weird things connecting when you go, wait a minute, is it really just ISIS in general as an army that was created by the Western? And yeah, I think we need to be honest about how clear that is. There's not all controlled everywhere kind of aspects, but to what you're highlighting is it's like, how do we miss that? 
the coordination of attacks with the people that they claim are state sponsors of terrorism, but then the terrorism you're pointing at is attacking them, or the areas like Yemen, where you have little pockets of Al-Qaeda or ISIS that have only grown within controlled Saudi Arabian territory, or Al-Tamf. I mean, it's just so transparently obvious. So, you know, thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Where do you think that's going to go, seeing as how these things are, whether they lie about it till, till the end, average people are actually talking about these things, which is amazing. Where do you think it goes? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, even um, because what I picked up on over the um, Crocus attack was that a few weeks before that, I mean, in with all the other contacts that people have gone over already, um, but there was actually a U.S. Um, cargo planes flew in Ukrainian military to the northeast of Syria where they met with uh, Kurdish Contra commanders and had meetings with US military. And of course, in the Northeast are all the ISIS holding camps. How convenient. So, you know, we know already that there are um, former ISIS fighters that were imported into Ukraine even before the SMO, so pre-2019 even. There are Chechen ISIS commanders and fighters um, in Ukraine now fighting alongside the Azov brigades and, and the other Nazi um, affiliates in Ukraine. Um, so why were Ukrainian commanders in the northeast of Syria? Now, they could be recruiting ISIS from the various US, UK funded uh, holding camps for ISIS fighters in the northeast of Syria. That's one aspect. Um, or is this looking at extending um, the borders of the wars, right? right? So we're seeing Israel from the south expanding the war into Syria. Are we going to start seeing Ukraine expanding the war by proxy against Russia um, inside Syria also? I mean, we know that already um, there have been multiple reports that uh, Ukraine has control of the Chechen uh, armed groups to a large degree in the Northwest, in the Idlib area, and they have been tasked with carrying out attacks on Russian uh, military positions and bases, right? So to me, this looks like the lines are starting to blur between um, the, the, the sort of separate compartmentalized wars that have been going on. And I think, I, I, I struggle to see how we don't head towards escalation and expansion right now because I understand that from October, you know, from October the 7th, really Syria, particularly because it's fighting a war of its own on so many fronts. I mean, it's three quarters surrounded by hostile states and, and occupying forces and terrorist uh, proxies. Um, and, but it has opened up its territories to the Islamic resistance, for example, to obviously Hezbollah is, is present anyway inside Syria, as is Iran. But particularly to the Islamic resistance Iraq, the majority of their attacks are carried out from Syrian territory. So of course, who is Israel bombing in retaliation? It's bombing Syria. So Syria, you know, a lot of people on Twitter, well, why doesn't Syria bomb Tel Aviv? Why Syria doesn't do this? It's not, a, you know, war is not a video game. It's, it's, you know, Syria is already in a quagmire. It doesn't have control of its resources. That, that's the most important factor in this. Russia does, Iran does. They have control of their resources. So even under sanctions, they can survive, right? right. Syria doesn't. And on top of that, it's got how many fronts now? One, two, three, four. The only safe border is with uh, Lebanon, basically at right. the moment and, and i think this is the the in, important you know part of how the isis aspect plays you know it's really about creating you know i mean real, i think what's interesting is how this has played such a central role in all of this from different angles mm -hmm. and i think it's more about the connective aspect to it but the, the point that you make mm -hmm. i just wanted to show this that you remember this was a, a corporate brought this went out on i think it was like a cnn different places just to make your point mm -hmm. about this, this was the isis patch if you can see that on his arm, and this is in Ukraine, and this this overlaps with all of these fields, with Syria, with 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 obviously with Ukraine, and then the Israel mm -hmm. aspect arming the Azov movement, the different groups along with it, you know, and then like or 
giving medical treatment to the moderate rebels and the Golan Heights. You know, you, it's the same point we're making, but how clearly this overlaps with all of it, which ultimately ends up being, you know, the, the proxy element that is the central role around all of this that ends up being the justifiable reason from the U.S. perspective to be able to support it and actions everywhere. I mean, this implicates that as you pull these threads, everything. Like all the foreign policy, every engagement, you know, and mm -hmm. it really does begin to kind of pull this whole thing apart. And I think that's what they're so afraid of. So from the U.S. perspective, how do you see this playing for them? Because that's an interesting dynamic for me right now, because I actually think that the U.S., as much as they would classically and still do to a large degree, support whatever they're doing, are recognizing rapidly how much <laughs> they're losing to continue to support it. So how do you think this plays out? Do you think they're going to support this? Do they want this to happen from a, you know, hierarchy mm -hmm. of US government perspective? It's, it's quite difficult to read. I mean, I would say the sudden um, shift in policy at the UN Security Council when the US recently abstained and the UK voted yes, um, that's political posturing, in my opinion, because both countries are coming up to elections. Right. You know, uh, Biden wants to be reelected. He knows he's losing support in, in Michigan in many of the swing states, right, over the genocide in Gaza. Rishi Sunak, the same thing. He's trying to delay the elections in the UK as far as he possibly can, but he can only go as far as, as January. So next year, I mean. Um, so, you know, I think that was just complete political posturing. I have absolutely no faith or confidence in their decisions being anything to do with any kind of humanitarian reflex um, in favor of the Palestinian people. However, what I do think is potentially going on is that there is conflict, even within the Biden administration, um, about the insanity that Israel is basically unleashing. I do think there is a Christian Zionist faction within you know republican and democrat that is pushing for escalation because of this crazy um end time belief that they need to basically trigger armageddon in order for the second coming of christ and as crazy as all of this sounds christian zionists have a massive influence in u.s politics and uk politics actually um and definitely of course within um israeli uh, political decisions so I do think that, that there's an element that's saying, you know, like, what the hell? Like, what are we doing? You know, but there's another faction that is saying, yes, go ahead. We want this kind of escalation. And I think um, the members of the resistance actors are perfectly aware of that faction that wants that major escalation. And so that is being factored into whatever response they're giving, because I think um, the Iranian ambassador, the Iranian foreign minister, the Syrian foreign minister all put out statements that basically said we will retaliate, but in our own time. Right. And I think that's the important uh, element in this. I don't think they're going to be hasty. I could be really wrong. And who knows what Israel is going to do in the meantime? You know, we're all kind of bracing ourselves for more attacks tonight because there just seems to be no end. And if it's tied in with the upsurge in terrorist attacks, um, particularly against Aleppo. I mean, at the moment, last night, there were drone attacks all night over Aleppo. The, the Syrian air defense was busy all night bringing down drones over civilian areas. So clearly, Aleppo is a target. Again, that brings in Erdogan because, and Turkey, because Aleppo was always you know, the jewel in his crown in Syria. I mean, in 2012, it was the al Tawid brigades that, that effectively, first of all, entered and occupied um, eastern Aleppo uh, under the control of, of Turkey, basically. So it's very difficult to read. Like my sane side says, no, surely they're not going to actually push this to open war. My kind of understanding of psychological, sociopathic, psychopathic, um, elements within western governments i accept that it's very possible hmm. 
you know, what's interesting <laughs> is all these people like you're talking about that are pushing that from that extreme side. It's interesting. And this is what makes me so alarmed about it. And it's, it's mm-hmm. the kind of general point we just made about all of the U.S. policy is that they seem to be willing to just destroy everything they ever claimed was valid and important and they were fighting for just to sell you on this, like like co- real-time contradictions of international law, of rules-based international order, equity, <laughs> quality, yeah. like everything and every angle. And like, like for instance, the one I just pointed out, I think I even have it pulled up here, was just uh, somebody who pointed, uh, Bridget, at, Bridget Gabriel, I'm not familiar with her account, but simply just highlighting this interview and saying, Israel's uh, airstrike has destroyed the consular section of Iran's embassy in Damascus. The strike killed terrorists, you know, just people that we were, were discussing in the military yeah. of Iran. I stand with Israel. And what's crazy about that statement is even if you claim they're terrorists, which is obviously a subjective statement, you know that that still violates international law. So you have people that have historically stood by that and are just happy to go, well, Israel, so who cares? You know, which shows yeah. everybody else that never really mattered. And that's just a really alarming thing. And, and that overlaps with that conversation about the prophecies, which, you know, I, I've just really talked about this, recently talked about it. And I'm going to do a little bit more on it. But even myself, when I first saw that come up, I'm like, I know of the history here in the conversation. But really? Like, I, I have to check that to make sure. I'm not gonna, <laughs> and I saw like the ABC report where they're like, even they were like, so what's going on here? Like asking them, like, so they genetically engineered these cows? And it's, so it's a, it's a totally yeah. real thing. And even saying this now, people are going to go, no, you know, like it's that crazy. <laughs> no, I know. Sacrifice. Go ahead. No, no. I mean, Matt Eret has been doing some amazing work on this. I think it's worth um, speaking to him over it because he's gone so into depth in it. And he's really worried about it, to be honest. Um, it's intense. You know, and it, 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 it's a really, um, you, you know, religion has so often been a driver of war we shouldn't really be that surprised and and for example the temple mount movement has been gathering momentum for some time um in the occupied territories and i think it's around april the 9th or 10th isn't it that yeah. they are talking about sacrificing the red cows that have been genetically modified to be red even their feet are red apparently even um, though that direct- predicts the idea that God did this, right? <laughs> You're choosing to do it just like the Belfort Declaration. You know, it's like, oh, who cares about the facts? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and then they're going to slaughter the cows, burn the cows, mix the ash from the cows with um, the river Silwar, I think it is. And then apparently if they cleanse themselves with this water, they're allowed to enter Al-Aqsa to pray and then they can start the destruction, I presume, of Al-Aqsa and build Temple Mount. Now, this is never going to happen, by the way, you know, this not without a complete and utter um, explosion in Palestine because Al-Aqsa is the third most holy site in Islam. So... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we, we just seem to be heading inexorably into some kind of awful escalation. And whatever the reason for it, um, Syria's bang in the middle of it again. You know, I mean, Syria has been like a, um, a war football pitch since 2011. Well, actually, more than that for about 75 years. But let's say escalated from 2011 onwards right and i don't see how it avoids being in that position again because i don't think either the us or israel at this stage are going to take on iran directly i mean that would be complete suicide um, i agree i think the Zionist but they can take out iraq and syria and lebanon right mm-hmm. and of course that's you know that's been spoken about for years with the clean break doctrine with the uh, Yinon plan, with the new Middle East, etc., Wesley Clark. Um, so, you know, however you interpret those various um, papers on dividing up the Middle East, that is clearly their intention: is to do away with all of the countries that basically oppose the existence of a Zionist settler colonialist project. And what worries me the most about is the point we just made about the the argument being this is supposed to be something that happens by divine intervention, right? Instead, they genetically <laughs> hear it and yeah. it happens. So the argument being that, well, if the whole point is 
once you do X, Y, and Z after the fact that then this can happen. Well, we don't need to guess. It, these people believe that they're that, that no matter what, no matter what the law says or what anybody in the government say, like this is something that they believe to the point where they've created. So what's going to stop them from then executing what needs to happen next, whether or not it's some divine intervention, which is the obvious point of this, that's Zionism in its essence. So that really does worry me about how serious, you know, in any of these kind of conversations, in any religion, it's not so much to me that they, whether they're real or not, but whether these people believe that it's real. And that really does terrify mm. me what they'll act on in that regard, you know? And so it just, I guess we will kind of put a pin in it there unless you've got any thoughts about how this will kind of continue forward in regard to the attacks or more attacks coming. I'll end with this point from George Galloway, just kind of a good kind of contrasting. It's not only Iran who will undoubtedly respond to what just happened in Damascus, but Russia too cannot allow such savage violations of the sovereignty of, of its 50-year ally, Syria, keep an eye on the Golan Heights. Now, what's interesting is by every, first of all, we already know by every aspect of international law, the occupation of Golan Heights gives Syria the, the act, mm -hmm. the, you know, armed rebellion, armed resistance, the legal, re, re, legal action of that. But his point is in regard to Russia. So now let's say Russia decides to act. Well, of course, they're going to frame that. And to the point you made before, the same way that Iran, ta you know, very you know, it just strategically waits. It doesn't just belligerently respond. It's because they know they will say Iran acted in terror and use that to go forward. But the point is that if Russia does something, they are legally, you know, the ally aspect. I mean, this is an act of war. They they could have a legal justification to respond, mm -hmm. but you know how that would be, re you know, played as by the Zionist and, and U.S. governments. But what's interesting is the dynamic of what Israel's doing right now to Palestine and the argument and the it's it's all the same stuff. So just your thoughts on the way out, how what double standards, how they're everywhere. And, you know, would Russia be legally, you know, would it be a legal attack if they did that right now? Well, yeah, it would be. I mean, for example, when Israel violated Syrian airspace, Russian and Syrian uh, air defense and planes have the right to, to bring those planes down. It was a hostile attack right that alone was a declaration of war that violation of syrian airspace um and and that demonstrates how israel is getting bolder with its attacks and 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 pushing even harder the envelope um what's interesting is that russia is definitely increasing its military bases on the border with the occupied Golan territory um i think there's three or four new uh, observation posts down there now and uh, i had a meeting with um some of the guys sort of involved in setting all that up um from moscow and and they said there are going to be more going up so that does make me wonder if russia is preparing because the thing is if israel is going to start carrying out attacks um on embassies <laughs> you know that that's such a dangerous escalation and at that point under international law i'm not sure of the actual law itself but there must be a clause in there that says you know russia has a military base it's there as a strategic ally of damascus um if damascus requests that it responds because of course whatever green light has to originate from damascus it can't originate um in tehran or in moscow it has to originate in damascus um, then there is potential for direct confrontation between either the U.S. and or Israel and Russia inside Syria. Yeah, well, well it's such a dark <laughs> note to end on, but I just think that you know it's 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 exactly where we are, and I and it's sadly, I think that it seems like as much as they always call Russia and the rest, you know, they're the big boogeyman bad guys, but it oddly always seems to rest on their inaction to hold off world war. Doesn't it? How often it's like, well, we'll push them. And then it's Russia's responsibility to go, okay, well, I know if I respond, they're going to use that to respond again. And so they make a tactful strategic decision yeah. to go, well, you know, we'll do something more strategic. It's like, does that, does it doesn't really sound like the, the big evil boogeyman, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, as always don't see any governments as on our side, quite frankly, but it's hard not to see the contrast between the way they're responding, the way that they're strategically acting, going I, even overlapping the entirety of 2011 forward in Syria. How many times Russia did not just take the bait? How many times they stood up for Syria at its own expense? You know, and just it's hard not to see that, you know, so I just really hope people can recognize. And I think that they are, quite frankly, how obvious this shows you the reality of the current leading structure of the U.S. government and Israel and what that says to 
all of us about our own history for pretty much as far back as we can look. So I'm really glad people are starting to question these things. Vanessa, it's always great to have you on. I think you're just such an important voice in this entire conversation and a lot of conversations. And that's why, of course, you're being censored, like all the important voices in the <laughs> conversations. So anything else you want to leave us with, up work, your links to, to check out and so on? No, I mean, people can follow me on Twitter <laughs> if they can find me. And um, actually, probably more so on Telegram, just Vanessa Bealey and my Substack are the easiest ways to, to find my updates. Well, absolutely. And I'll make sure to include those in the show notes. And it's always great to talk to you, Vanessa. And uh, we'll touch base soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. She's such an important voice, really, guys. I just I hope you will take the time to check out her sub stack, to check out her other work as far back as it goes. I mean, it's it's a really it's it's uh, and it will be included in the show notes. It's just she always has an important perspective on what's going on. And quite frankly, it's because she's honest and objective and nonpartisan. Shocking, I know. But a couple of things I want to add. Somebody in the chat on the Instagram chat threw this out there. And I just want to include this. It actually relates to the aid, humanitarian aid, food aid. Por por uh, portion of the show from the beginning. Apparently, this is breaking news. Palestinians are citing this on the ground. Four aid workers and their drivers have been or driver have been killed in an Israeli strike in Gaza. This is the Times of Israel. The Palestinian media report four aid workers with World uh, Central.